even though I got hit with the FTC, you didn't have to deal with any of that. I protected you. I'm clean, good. Like our processing record is amazing. Why are we having this conversation? It's out of their hands. It's at levels above and above them and above them. And there's policies written into, like they just can't do it. They're sorry, man, this exists. Like I can't get around it. I just had this today in a conversation. Well, I have a private Facebook group. I, they can't touch that. And I'm like, well, who's in the private Facebook group? Is it your clients? I'm like, yeah. Well, yeah, they can touch it. I'm telling you, whatever money you're making right now, I know you're living the high life, you're loving it, loving life. I'm telling you right now, it's not worth it. There is nothing. I want you not only to list what the products and services you offer, I want you to give me a written explanation, including pricing of all those products and services. If I want to do an event and charge five, six, seven thousand dollars, ten thousand for people to come to, the, no problem. Welcome back to Don't Say That. And today we're gonna to have an interesting episode. I know that many of you that are watching may or may not, you, you know, unless you've been necessarily sued by the FTC or are currently going through a litigation with a state AG or an FTC, it's not necessarily relevant, but it is. We're gonna talk about life after settling with the FTC. And I'm early in my tenure there. So I have lots of questions and Greg has been around for long enough to see many clients have life after the FTC and or after settling with the FTC or state AGs or whoever. And I think the point, let's just get, let's, let's, let's put, let's get to the point. Like what is the thing I want you to take away from this episode and why did I want to do this episode? It was Greg's suggestion. I loved it. Um, well, actually I didn't. Initially I was like, nah, because most people aren't going to be relevant. But then I thought, you know what? No, it makes sense. The goal here that we have is for you to understand how much it sucks to get sued by a regulator. Uh, state, federal, because it doesn't just end. So many people have actually told me this too. All right, well, I mean, it was a year or two on it, you know, it sucked. And so, but like, you're back, you, you'll come back real quick, right? And we'll have to worry about that. That's in the past. It ain't in the past. It's never in the past. And I'm learning that really quickly. And so the goal here is, guys, more inspiration and motivation for you. Please get compliant. Please do it. It's just not worth it. I'm telling you, whatever money you're making right now, I know you're living the high life, you're loving it, loving life. I'm telling you right now, it's not worth it. There is nothing. I was making millions a year, and I'm telling you, it ain't worth it. So take my word or don't. But um, Greg's here to back me up, too, and Greg has watched many clients. Um, I got a card, Greg. You're going to like this story. Oh, by the way, guys, everyone say hi to Attorney Greg. He's here. Look at him. Look at him looking all spick and span. So I put this jacket on just because this guy tried to show me up today on the podcast. So um, he's got a tie. Did you guys have court today, by the way? Uh, yeah, that's the only days he wears suits and ties, by the way. That is, so that's how that you know he went to court. I was or judged. he wears his robe. You, can you come to one of our episodes with your judge robe on? That would be fun. My white wig? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> your white wig. Only in UK. Um, so you're going to love this, Greg. Um, I told you before that we're getting a lot of people thanking me for what we're doing, I'm sure you are as well. I'm getting daily messages now. It's not just, it's every day one to two people that will message me to say thanks for all you guys are doing. This is a big service to the industry. Greg, I've been in business for 20 years and I never got that many thanks for what I was doing before. So it makes me happy. Um, uh, it's a little dramatic because I'm constantly reliving this nonsense, but you know, I'm, I'm going to an event. Um, as it's time we're recording this, by the time you're listening to it, it'll already be done. I'm going to an event, speaking at an event for Taylor Welch. Um, uh, Greg and I are speaking at a huge mastermind end of this month. I think I've booked like three or four more events. So I'm getting out there. The books come out there. I mean, we're excited, right? But it is. Um, so I appreciate you guys sharing that. Greg, I got a thank you card physically in the mail yesterday. Um, and the thank you card was about this. It was just, hey, thank you for what you and Greg are doing in the industry. We really need this. And said, I was, this is the part that was funny. So if you sent this to me, it was hilarious and I enjoyed it. They said, I was going to send you this in a certified letter or a FedEx package. Oh, messed up, bro. <laughs> but it's, it's, that's funny, but that's messed up. <laughs> it's because I've talked about how I have PTSD. Yeah. Listen, everybody. First of all, that was funny, and I like it. And had you sent that to me, just so you guys know my sense of humor, had you sent that to me in a certified letter, uh, I would have laughed. I would have genuinely laughed. I wouldn't have been upset about it. But not, don't, that's not an invitation for everyone to go start emailing or mailing me this shit. Please, leave me alone. But um, when I say I have PTSD from receiving a certified letter or a FedEx package, you guys don't understand. I'm not kidding around. 
And I'm not trying to be disrespectful at all because it's in nothing in comparison to what our armed soldiers and people that are veterans have. I'm not trying to compare the two, but I'm just letting you know I do freak the heck out. And it drops and my blood pressure goes through the roof. My heart plummets. I, I hate it to the point now where I have a rule with my assistant. Anything that says certified or anything like that, she has to open it beforehand, look at it, and then brief me before handing it to me. I feel like Iron Man, like where I'm like, I don't like to be handed things. I don't like to be handed certified letters or FedEx packages. This is a true story. Two days ago in the evening, my wife comes home from being out. She had a girl's night out. So it's like 11 o'clock. She walks in. And I can hear. I'm still watching TV. So I can hear, like, hear downstairs. She's like picking stuff up. And all of a sudden, I hear a lot of grumbling. Like, do, 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 do. I'm like, what is going on? So she comes up and she's like, <sighs> she has a packet in her hand. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like ripping this packet open. She's like, oh, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. I'm like, what is going on? You know what it was? It was a FedEx packet. It said extremely urgent on it. And she was having a freaking panic attack and she was trying to get to it to see what it was because she thought we are yet again getting sued and so this doesn't just impact you it's impacting it impacts your family it impacts everything and everyone and it lasts for a while it turned out by the way it was curtain samples <laughs> it was and it's, i don't know why it's extremely urgent it was literally curtain samples it was like cloth samples for a curtain um so i just yeah i really want to talk about today because I'm I'm still living it. I choose to live it because I'm teaching it, but it sucks and it stays with you. Um, I've been turned down now for merchant accounts. I had, uh, I won't name the bank because then they get upset, but I had a bank send me back my money. It wasn't a lot, but they shut down my bank account. <laughs> Just a savings account. They say your business, we don't want, I'm banned for life. They let me know. You're never allowed to open an account here again. I'm like, geez, Louise, right? And I'm not, by the way, I'm not even a convicted anything. It was a settlement. Um, it's nasty out there, man. You, you, it comes up in all my background searches, right? I have to address this consistently, but that's not just everything. We're going to talk about, uh, about this, uh, before I get into that. So my, my, my big thing, guys, I went on this like random rant. Sorry, Greg. I didn't even let Greg talk. <laughs> it's just because it hurts and it I sucks. Um, <laughs> I'm just using this as a time to vent. Uh, now let me do the promo book launching very soon, April 16th. Don't say that.com. Get on the pre-alert list. We've been working really hard on it. Please buy a book. <laughs> like we worked really hard on it. So kudos to Greg. Um, and also, uh, don't say that. Sorry. N A O A C.com forward slash audit. The URL is in the YouTube video description below. If you want a free marketing assessment, you got to get a gauge of how good or bad your marketing is. I'd be happy to help you. And then be Maybe we'll give you a proposal for a full marketing audit, which I think you should do. Please uh, get out of don't don't be non-compliant. Stop. Like, it's just not worth it. Greg, you just had a client um, that had an issue and uh, talk about this because my agreement lasts for 10 years, 10 years. They started at 20. We got it down to 10. What is that? Can you explain what I have to do for 10 years? Yeah, so I know a lot of you are going to be like, hey, I'm not under investigation. I didn't settle. So how is this relevant to me? But I told Onik, I, I said, if you want to go eyes wide open and understand what it's like to go through an investigation lawsuit, you got to understand the complete ramifications, not just through the process, which is horrible. And then you finish and you think, oh, I'm at the finish line. I'm done. But it's not true. Every year for in Onik's case, 10 years and other clients for longer, um, you have to give them an annual report. You have to basically walk through several things in your business and tell the FTC where you're at, where you're located, where your contact information is. And if you fail to do that, then it can open you up for additional scrutiny and enforcement action. Because if you don't properly or timely disclose that information, they can send what's called a deficiency letter. And they can say, hey, you know what? We don't think you've met our burden. So now we're going to ask not just for what we do in the order, we're going to ask for a lot more information. So the reason I think this is so important is to understand this. And a lot of my clients will go through this. It's almost as painful. I, I know, Anaki, you were like, hey, this is traumatic just talking about this stuff. But when you come to that anniversary after one year of settling in a case like this, and you have to sit down, it's not quite a year because it's 11 months because you're going to get prepped to be able to have this filed by the annual uh, anniversary of, of your settlement, you got to sit down and relive a lot of this. And every year when I sit down with clients, it's almost like therapy sessions because they they start to jerk and like, ah, they don't want to, they want to- I'm doing it. it right now. 
I know. I'm do, I'm doing it because the, Wait. The reason, it's not that there's anything to hide. It's just that people don't want to relive it. And Why do we need a month? Yeah. We, what? I didn't know that. Why do I have to start a month before? What am I doing exactly here? Because, uh, you because gotta, I'm already freaking you gotta out. You got to give me enough time to, to make sure that I can follow up with the questions to make sure that I understand what the answers are before I give it over to the FTC. Okay. So these things, I want to make sure that we, we catch it. Okay. Maybe. So contact information, addresses, no problem, whatever. I'm not hiding. I'm here. Um, but also a list of every single business thing I'm doing, any way I'm earning money. Um, if I'm doing, do I have to reveal the people I'm working with? Like how extensive is this? Cause the CID was, was a full blown colonoscopy. Okay, um, let me just go through the. So let me go through without mentioning people's names. A yes. deficiency letter that I just received from the FTC that I responded to last month for a client that had settled a case, and the FTC had additional questions for them. So, and I know you said no disrespect to the military or anything else for having PD, PSD, but understand this: if you look at the most stressful things, and this is proven, right? In life, I would say death, divorce, moving, high level, lawsuits, going through any sort of investigation for an 18 month period of time and then settling a case, that's got to be up there. I mean, I, I guess I get it's not war, but there's a lot of other, you know, yeah. it, it's traumatic. It's traumatic. So let's go through. So one, and this is all why you don't want to go through this process, everybody. I, I'm sharing with you because you want to live this vicariously through on it. You don't want to live this yourself. You want to make sure that, okay, we're going to avoid this by having what Onyx said earlier, best practices as it, as it pertains to marketing. Because then you don't get on this radar. You don't have to go through all this pull. You can just operate your business and, and live life and be happy and peaceful and all that. So let's go through some of the questions that they asked in the deficiency letter after following up on the annual report. So again, what Onyx said is, they came to him for 20 years. My experience is normally about 10 years you have to be reporting on this, but that's still a decade. That's a long time. In fact, I'm doing a report this week for a client who settled six years ago. And it's like, oh, we have to do this again. I mean, it gets worse and worse every but, year. But Greg, can I pause you real quick? Just Absolutely. so you, just so people understand the value of your wisdom there and knowledge. I was told by multiple attorneys that 20 is 20. As a matter of fact, I know of people that settled in a vicinity and time frame around me that agreed to the 20. I shared that with you. And when no. I asked you, you're like, no, 10 will be fine. And I was told, no, it won't. And sure enough, it was one request, one email saying we'd like this change. And they said, okay. And guys, there's a big difference between 10 years of reporting and 20. Big difference. Hell, I would have been 60 and still reporting to them. Like, <laughs> you know, so... Just you you said that, but this is another very important reason, everyone. You got to have the right attorney who does FTC or state AG or whatever the hell department you have any trouble with. Not a generic government attorney. Like it got to be specific. Anyway, sorry. I, go ahead. No, I'm glad. OK, let's go through these questions so you can see what a deficiency letter would ask for. Because you think, OK, well, what do I have to provide them? OK, question number one. List all of your social media accounts, right? So if you think, oh, I'm just going to settle with the FTC, I'm going to set up a whole bunch of new accounts. They don't have to look at those. No, nope. you have to list all of them out. All private groups or channels on social media platforms created or controlled by you. So I know a lot of clients are like, I just had this today in a conversation. Well, I have a private Facebook group. I, they can't touch that. And I'm like, well, who's in the private Facebook group? Is it your clients? And like, yeah. Well, yeah, they can touch it because mm. just because you've blocked it from everybody else to see doesn't mean that they don't have a right to look at that as well. Um, all websites owned and operated. That makes sense. You, you would want to make sure that that's there. All products and services offered or sold by you, including a description of each product and service. So remember, you've settled. You're not doing this anymore. They're asking you, what are you doing now? I want you not only to list what the products and services you offer, I want you to give me a written explanation, including pricing of all those products and services. All corporate entities in which you are directly or indirectly have ownership of. Now, that's a hard one to kind of govern, right? Because 
how are they really going to know? But they know there was a case that I settled with the FTC where I didn't know the client had something out of the country, but the government did. They knew. So when I went to my clients, like, what the hell? Why didn't you tell me that this was because now I look like an idiot and I'm going to have to disclose all this anyway. So don't put And it's the same thing with the reporting requirements that they find out that you have a, an ownership interest in something and you haven't disclosed it. It's, it's an issue. Then identify by percentage each person or entity that you own a, an ownership interest with, full names, contact information of not only people who are partners with you, but who are employed by you. Um, now, this is obviously, this is far more than the general reporting requirements you have in a settlement. But if they find that there's an issue with deficiency, then the leverage they have with you to ask these additional questions is, you don't want to mess with us. We don't want to bring in enforcement action. Now, mm. in this case, I responded. I haven't heard from them in 30 days, but we had to go through the process of that. And my gut is that, that this will go away. I've, it's very rare that you have an additional enforcement action that comes after a settlement. But if we hadn't responded, I'm sure they would have gone there on this case. So... Mm. And you have to list all that. So the next one was for all consumers who have participated or enrolled or you've billed in connection with the products and services you just talked about, list their full name, phone number, email address, mailing address. So all of your customers, including the products they bought and the price they paid for all the products that they paid for. So... You don't want to mess around with that because you don't want to have to turn around and give this information to the government later on. So the reason I mentioned this to Onik was because he didn't know that I had been dealing with this. And I, I this is part of what I do is getting these prepped to submit to the FTC on an annual basis for clients that I've settled uh, agreements so, with. So, so on the original submission, you don't have to give all your websites, all your social media, all your this, all your that. But I, my assumption is you try to be thorough enough to not – is it – okay, would it be a fair assessment that when you – when the original submission happened, the FTC felt like there was something more. they're hiding? More. What's that? Yeah, that there was more. Same thing. Yeah, exactly. So, so they got a sniff – that something's not lining up this isn't they're they're hiding something or they're not disclosing something and after that they come in with the hammer because they don't want to mess around but if you right from the beginning are giving them enough to give them a good visual and a good idea of what you're doing um well then... let's go through let's go through because these are all oh, just so you know, i have a like, question sorry i do have a one yeah, question yeah, yeah, please, yeah. what percentage of you this guys can tell strong. this is kind of, it's kind of this relevant to me. Please, uh, ask you a question. <laughs> Free legal advice. Yes. <laughs> he doesn't bill me for the podcast. So. Yes. Um, uh, what percentage, if you had to guess, for let, let's say for every hundred of these submissions that you do for your clients, what, how many do you think come back demanding that level of further intel? Uh, less than 10%. For sure. Less than 10%. Small. And and have you seen a common thread amongst those 10% of <laughs> why yeah. they yes. got pinned? Yeah. What is that? They, they lose their minds and they go out there and they start marketing. It, maybe they, they think in their minds, well, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to, instead of doing an Amazon store, I'm going to do a VBRO course, or I'm going to do go and do, instead of doing a real estate training course, I'm going to go out there and sell stock information. And then they go out there and they're, they're very active on social media on the advertising of this new offer. And they're not following any of the rules or guidelines that they went through. Because you're going to remember, most of my clients that I helped through settlement or lawsuits with the FTC, I didn't represent when they were making the marketing practices. Mm. They came to me afterwards to help settle or litigate the case. So yeah. there's oftentimes where I haven't done a review or I haven't kind of helped direct their marketing practices because they never hired me to do that. So you settle a case and they just go back to the same practices, same bad habits by not asking what they should or shouldn't do, even though they've settled with the commission. So then they start making these social media posts, which draw attention because 
once you're on the target, they're going to check up on you, you know, periodically. And if mm. it gets really loud, meaning the advertising is like in your face advertising, it's going to draw their attention. And I think in, in the, the few cases that I've had to do follow-ups with this, it's always the same. It's somebody who decides to get a little aggressive with their marketing. And then the FTC is like, okay, listen, let's look at their annual disclosures. I don't see any of this in their annual disclosures. Let's do a follow-up. Because mm. the settlement agreements for reporting requirements are almost verbatim. If you go back and you look at yours or you look at uh, traffic and funnels or, or you look at you know any of the ones that we've discussed over the last few months that have settlement agreements, the compliance reporting section of all of the consent judgments, that's what they call these settlements, all of them are almost identical. For you and for others, it's number one, after one year of entry of the order, you've got to give physical addresses for both business and, and personal, phone numbers, emails, all businesses, all by names, numbers, addresses, et cetera, describe all business activities you're engaged in and that you're, you've got to give an acknowledgement that you're in compliance with the order. And then you've, that you've proven that you've given the order to all the people that you were supposed to give it to over the last year. So that's, that's pretty much, um, you know, the first section, then at 10 years for the next 10 years, you have to report any designations of changes of contact information, corporate structure, changes in your role, title, whether you filed for bankruptcy and a sworn statement that you are following the laws of the of this country and the consent order that you've entered into. Um, then they require rep record keeping, which are things like you agree that for five years, you'll keep things like accounting records, personal records, consumer complaints and refunds, uh, records to some de demonstrate compliance in, in all of your advertising copy for five years. Plus, you have to have compliance monitoring and that you need to interview key uh, individuals in your organization to make sure that they are following the rules as well. And if you get requested for any documents at any time during this 10 year period of time for reporting, you have to automatically like I did, which was the deficiency letter, provide that to the FTC. So again, it's almost like going through a mini investigation settlement once a year, because you wanna make sure, because the follow-up questions that I always have for clients that have gone through this is, what are you doing on social media? Because that's where they're gonna look at as well. And so I try to do that, but if they, if they have a private Facebook group I can't see and they don't tell me and I don't disclose that, it mm. just pisses the FTC off. And then they open yeah. up these deficiency orders. So, so that's interesting. By the way, just you talking, I was, I was totally reliving it. Like, I don't, I don't. I know. That's what I'm saying. The, the only nice thing I guess here about me is I have a zero <laughs> intention whatsoever of violating any of the things that I signed. But I've also kind of come to learn that sometimes there's a, difference of opinion right like i'm like i'm not violating it this is totally fine and depending on how badly the opposite party wants to hear what they want to hear they could change their they could say something so so to clear in my case right and i don't mind asking this question publicly but my settlement doesn't at all bar me in any way of being in the space that i've been in for 20 years the thing that I mostly agreed to and the thing that they had an issue with me was like no, no using those those results based testimonials unless I have typicality studies and substantiation. I'm not going to use results based testimonials at all specific to like especially earnings um, and then no making claims, especially again about earnings. Um, my goal right now is to go back in and still teach email marketing and still teach affiliate marketing and still be able to show people how to build an email list that they can monetize with affiliate marketing. And I'm thinking, I've, I've, I've actually called you about this. So I'm thinking nothing I've said so far is giving you unrest as long as I don't do any of these testimonials and claims, but I keep it really about the skill of building an email list to then possibly monetize with affiliate marketing. Um, and I, and, and if I want to do an event and charge five, six, seven thousand dollars, ten thousand for people to come to, the, no problem. But again, if I'm selling that on the phone, make sure no, what is your goal and 
hey, we had Sally make $10,000, like none of that. So could it be that if in a year I do a disclosure and I'm like, hey, I'm still teaching email marketing and affiliate marketing, that they could automatically just be like, really? Well, we want to see your marketing material. Or is it more like they'll quickly go scan my social media and stuff, see my ads on Facebook and be like, oh, we see his ads, we see his landing page. It's it's not claimy at all. And so let it be. Well, you don't have to provide that unless they ask for it on your okay. order. You have to tell them what you're doing. But if it's not until they ask for your ad copy, you have to give it. Yeah. No, so, I think I meant more like, are they more likely to ask people for those extra level of things when they find that you're still in the same business that you used to be in? No. Or that doesn't have anything to do with it. It's more of how aggressive you are in your advertisement. Okay. You're in there Got and you're, because remember part of yours and, and every other settlement is that you won't give earnings claims. Every settlement says that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. regardless if it's on the phone or in live person. So now you've entered into an agreement not to do that. Where yeah. initially they couldn't, if it was a live event or if it was a one-to-many uh, direct sell that didn't constitute a telemarketing activity under the TSR, they they couldn't try to collect damages for that under the, you know, the act. But now, because you have a consent order, if you violate an agreement not to give those, there's an argument that they could make under, and this is the, the whole notice of violation stuff that they have. The, mm. Really, the, the premise on that is for people that have entered into settlement agreements, if they violate the the, the notice of vi, you know violation, that they could go after them for those you know fifty thousand dollars per violation. They yeah. could do that for people who do settle it and they're dragged. I hundred percent believe there's an authorization. I don't. I haven't litigated a lot of the enforcement action cases because they just don't bring them very often. But I think mm -hmm. that they would make that argument if they brought one versus if you get one of those notice of violation letters in the mail and then you get it and you're like, I'm not part of this order. How are they really going to enforce that? We don't know yet, right? They, they've got settlements, but I don't, I won't play a lot of, put a lot of credit into that until they litigate the issue. But okay. back to this point. Now, why are we talking about this? Most of you are like, this isn't me. I haven't been through this. You don't want to go through this. We're explaining what That's the why. process is. This is yeah. life. And you yeah. have to relive it every freaking year. If you, even if you enter, enter into a settlement agreement that you're not going to love, but you'll live with, you still have to remember it for 10 years. Well, and what about, so after, on average, let's say you submit um, your, your annual report, how long after that do they usually let you know that they want further stuff? Is it weeks? Is it months? Uh, within about 30 days, you, you'll know. Okay. Um, so that's the other thing that sucks about this, right? Is every year you have to relive that anxiety to yeah. see that when you submit what you submit, are they going to come back with a mini CID or not? That sucks. That's the part of the case that I hated the most is you would do stuff and then wait and you have no idea what's going on. So Greg, at the, um, I have a question. So specific to the FCC, do they have like a special department that is there to monitor past settlements or is it the same attorney that came after me and that I settled with? Or do they have like a whole team that literally has a list? And so someone has my file and they're supposed to check in on me every so and now and then that yeah, they're, they're your parole officer. They come in. Parole? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say earlier, I feel like I'm on parole. Yeah, Honestly, crazy. that's how it feels. Yeah. It's not like a parole officer, but what it is is it is it is a um it's they call it the enforcement division i know that sounds weird because you think well didn't they bring an enforcement action against me and it, it really isn't they bring yeah. an investigation lawsuit from the consumer protection division of marketing practices brings that action so instead of the that division then it goes to what a, a different team called the enforcement team and so you don't really deal with the same attorneys you generally settled with. It's a different group of attorneys and staff that you deal with. And so you, you have different levels of scrutiny. And again, it's gambling too. You know, as well as I do, when I settle cases, not all uh, attorneys you work with the FTC are credit equal. I mean, some of them are a lot, I wouldn't say kinder and gentler. I just think they're easier to work with than others. And mm. if you get the wrong shake of the dice and you're dealing with somebody who's really jonesing for some sort of like advancement within the FTC or, you know, private counsel uh, after and some law firm that's going to pay a bazillion dollars from having that FTC experience. 
and they're hard to work with because they have an agenda, um, it's it's hard. But with the enforcement, I find that they're generally pretty reasonable. Um, they will get upset if you try to play around with them. So I don't mess with it. I, I always recommend to try to start at least 30 days in advance so that we don't, can answer questions to do that. But the point is, you don't want to live this. You don't want to have to go through that. It's it's no, almost, like, it is almost like probation because like, and I don't do criminal law, but you know, if you're on probation, you got to check in with your probation officer. And no, you, it's, it's checking in it's with 100% the like that. It feels like that, man. You're good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it feels it, like it really that. It does. And it's like that, right? Yeah. Whether it is or not, I'm just letting everyone know it feels like that, right? And so it's just a reality that I live with. Um, I don't, someone asked me the other day, they said, do you feel like you look, you're always looking over your shoulders? I honestly don't. I'm just being honest with you guys. But mostly because I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't know how to say that. Like, I don't. Like if they came today and said, send us all your stuff. I'm okay, cool. Like if they asked for all my customer list right now, like I'm fine with it. The only problem is, you know, when you have to give up all your customer list, it's like, um, like I don't have any problem with my Range Rover. I love my Range Rover. But if someone called me from the government tomorrow, the Department of Transportation, hey, we're the Department of Transportation. We're calling in regards to your Range Rover. There's been a lot of complaints about it. How, do you have any problems with it? And then all of a sudden I'd be like, you know what? Come to think of it, three months ago, I had an issue with the block on the blah, blah, blah. It's kind of annoying. And it's like, that sucks, right? So from that perspective, customers, I don't know what they're going to say. But mostly I'm okay. I don't feel like I'm looking over my shoulders. But it does suck to have all those additional conversations. I mean, for merchant processing, people that processed for us for a long time. Now for a new company, asking 30 questions, wanting personal guarantees. And I'm like, guys, we've been working together for over 10 years. Like, even though I got hit with the FTC, you didn't have to deal with any of that. I protected you. I'm clean, good. Like our processing record is amazing. Why are we having this conversation? It's out of their hands. It's at levels above and above them and above them. And there's policies written into like they just can't do it. They're sorry, man. This exists. Like I can't get around it. And you just feel like you feel dirty. <laughs> you know, I just feel like, wow, I'm, I'm like got the scarlet letter on me. That's that's kind of sometimes. Right. And then listen, getting a check. Pastor, back. Listen, sir, don't go there. Cheers. Yeah, exactly. And then getting the money back from that bank. It was funny because I forgot that bank account existed. I'm being honest with you guys. I had very little money in there. There was nothing much in there. And I had started a long, long time ago. I was going to do some trading and I never did. So I kind of laughed and I'm like, oh, cool. Like, <laughs> thanks. I forgot about this money. But then you're like, wait, really? Like, what does my settlement with them have to do with having a savings account with you? Like, it's just so wrong. It's just and the way so you, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so you just have to deal with Well, my favorite, right, is um, someone I know who settled had a Wells Fargo account and got kicked out in the most ceremony, unceremonious way. Like, get out. You have seven days. And he had a lot of money there. And he knew what the hell to do. And he's like, he's telling me the story. And then you look at Wells Fargo's history and it's like, dude, you, you had some of the worst cases from the government against you. Like, who are you to judge people? But anyways. You deal with this. This is a reality. And one of the things I I don't hide, right? Obviously, I'm running a podcast about it. I wrote a book about it with Greg. Like, but um, so I, I get out ahead of it. But even right now, when we're talking about there was a a, um, a deal I was looking at doing, possibly didn't work out. I was going to partner with someone on something, and I was like, hey guys, let's before we even start, this is what happened. This is where I am. You know, if we work together, they ask me to disclose every year. I'll have to disclose I'm working on this project. So if there's any intention of doing dumb foolery, I need to know now. It sucks. I mean, it just sucks because it's an extra crap to go through. And it's like, then people ask questions. Oh, how did it happen? Or what had happened? You know, next thing you know, the whole call is an hour long consultation session on FTC compliance. And so, um, guys, just please clean up. So there's some of you, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm not going to mention names, but there's some of you that I have had a heart to heart, serious conversation with. You are doing more than enough revenue. You are violating every rule in the book. You are public. And you're not listening. And I and I personally can't fathom why. I just don't understand. So that's the best we could do, right? That's the best Greg and I can do is we can spread the message. But um, Greg, real quick, we're running out of time. But what are some of the other things? So we got the disclosures that have to happen every year. We just found out there's an entire department called the enforcement division sounds sounds really scary that's watching you right so i mean i may not look like someone's watching me but i'm like over my shoulders but they are i just found out so okay 
Um, you've got the potential challenges and issues with merchant processing and banking and things coming up on your background check that have to be concerned that you have to be concerned about. Um, what else? Is there any other fallout that you've seen for people that go through this that would be part of life after the FTC settlement? Licensing. I've had clients that have tried to get licensed, either like a Series 6 or 63 with the FTC or the SEC or FINRA, or trying to get other licenses, and they have to report the settlement, and it draws triggers for it where the it either slows the process or they decline the licensing. So, um, Have you seen anyone get approved that had that, or they all get declined? No, I've, I've seen people approved with it, especially if it's the difference. I mean, if you have an SEC violation and you're applying for licensing, yeah. and that, that's the death now. But if you have FTC, but if they consider it an element of fraud, that's what they'll look at it. And so it's the scrutiny, the level of scrutiny to go through that is very tough. I know mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm applying for a new bar uh, state to be licensed in as an attorney, and I have to list everything that's in there. I would have to give them, if I was applying, if I had gone through a settlement with the FTC, I'd have to provide the lawsuit to the state bar to get access as an attorney. And they may decline me because of that. Now, I know most of you aren't attorneys and you're not trying to get licenses there, but it applies across the board. If you're in a state and you're like, hey, I want to register this as a security, and then you have to die, you know, disclose that you are part of an FTC or an AG investigation and lawsuit, they may turn out, I have a, I have a client that's a uh, real estate broker and he's in an investigation lawsuit right now. And when he disclosed it, it took us months to get his, his, his realtor license. He was just trying to be a realtor. And so these type of actions, they can affect with other types of businesses that you're engaged in because of the wow. side of having to report those to other agencies. I have, um, I have a friend who just got licensed uh, to sell life insurance, IULs. Right, same thing. Um, yeah, and he and it's funny, he just asked me the other day. He was just randomly curious. He's like, hey, would you have a problem getting that approved? And I, I didn't even think to ask. Like, I was, I'm not going to become a life insurance agent, but you're saying, yeah, I, I would probably Good. have a hard time. You'd have to disclose it, and it would be up to them to, to determine whether or not the state would allow you to come in and sell insurance. Wow. Well, guys, there you go. That sucks, right? It's it's like being told, yeah, it's like, and I think what sucks the most about it, if I may vent for a minute, is that it was a settlement. It, it wasn't- No admission convicted. of guilt. No admission of guilt, yet there you go. Lots of things that are gone. Do I plan on, be, I, I, funny enough, I was, I had my series uh, 26, 23, and series six uh, when I was much younger. So I have no intention of going back in that world. I don't wanna go back to that world, but, um, you never know where life takes you, right? I'm, I am where I am today, and I never know where I want to be in five or ten years. And all of a sudden, this thing I did ten years ago that happened, like, it's just it's a hurdle. We had this issue. So one of the companies that I was a co-investor in, um, one of the people involved in that company had at that time already settled with the FTC some years past. Oh, man. We were about to sell that company to another company, and that company's goal was to go public. And they found out about this issue with the other person and that other person needed to go with the company that were going to eventually go on to become part of the management team. And they claimed, I don't know if it was 100% this, because I think there were some other issues, but they that became a sore issue, man. It became a sore issue. And that ended up there saying why the whole acquisition fell off. Um, it's I, I think the way I'll put it is this. It's not worth it to be in a position where you have to have that conversation all the time. Yeah. Just constantly you, find yourself having you to explain relive it over and over again, yeah. especially for the constantly, we re constantly do that. So guys clean up. All right. That's the goal. That's the goal of this book. That's the goal of the audit we're offering. NAOAC.com forward slash audit. That is the goal of the book. Don't say that.com. When it comes out, grab a copy. That is the goal of everything that we're doing here. So tell others, listen and take action. Greg, as always, man, thank you for your time. You rock. You give us so much advice and wisdom that I know you charge thousands of dollars for. So I appreciate that. That's not a claim. He can substantiate it and back it up with his legal bills. Um, I can substantiate it. I can substantiate it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And that is the typical result of a client yeah. that hires an attorney. You pay a lot of money. It's typical. So see, Greg, see what you I'm doing. More money, man? though. You pay more money, though, when you go through an investigation or lawsuit than you do if you have a... Um, 
infinitely more yes. money. Infinitely Let me tell you more. that. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. It's just not worth it. I know I keep saying this. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to get through to you. It is not worth it. I know how good life is for you. You might be making millions. You're violating these rules. I believe it's a matter of when, not if, and it's not worth it. And you will agree with me if you don't change your course and do it later. I've said it. You've heard it. You can't have an excuse later. Love you guys. We're here for you. Reach out to us if we can help you in any way. Thank you for all the support and love you've shown us and thrown our way. And as I always say, when life pushes you, stand straight, smile, and push it the heck back. Talk to you later. Bye.